Okay, in this video I'm going to try to explain a little bit about what I know about fracturing and the materials that can be flint napped and uh, I don't often get this question sometimes I do but uh, I don't get it as often as I think it should be discussed uh, especially by new people who are trying to learn flint napping uh, but also as you're getting into flint napping you're, you're wondering why certain fractures happen the way they do and I don't and uh, you say to yourself I don't understand why it did this or did that uh, there's one classic example that all the books have and many of the flint napping videos have and it's uh, discussing something called conchoidal fracturing now I personally don't like that explanation it's too simple and uh, I'm going to go over why I think so. Um, let me show you this cast first. Now this cast is of a uh, Allen point and I believe these are late paleo or early archaic I'm not sure but very early type and at the very early stages they learn how to do flaking like this. Not only flaking like this but control of the uh, material so that they could achieve this kind of thinness in combination with this type of flaking. Now this point is a cast, it's not a real one. Uh, it is a cast of a real one but it's just as plastic so uh, I probably could not afford the real one. Anyway, um, I'll put a link to this one to where I got it in the description. Uh, the reason why I brought this out is because early nappers had no idea of why or how stone fractured in this way. They learned all of their techniques through experience. So um, even though lots of people ask about how material fractures and why it fractures in a certain way uh, when they're learning to nap, uh, I'm bringing this point out to illustrate that it's not necessary to know that. However, if you are learning it or if you've already been exposed to it, uh, it's important to get some clarifications or to, or to get some more explanation into it, the actual fracturing because it will confuse you and it, uh, an explanation that's too simple will hinder you in your flint napping. Uh, first of all, uh, you know this example about a BB hitting a pane of glass producing a uh, like a blown out void here that looks like a cone uh, producing a fracture with a bulb of percussion and so forth and this assumes that the line of force is you know at 90 degrees to the workpiece or to whatever this material is well this is good for thin material like this and for this particular angle of applied force. And this is the top view. Um, but it doesn't explain very well what happens if you have the same material but the applied force is not straight on or not at a 90 degree angle. You would assume that this is what, this is what the cone would look like or the fracture would look like if the force was applied this way. But in many cases this is not how it works especially with thicker material uh, so how do you explain that well how do you explain what happens um, in my experience these fractures are more like waves they don't travel in a straight line very far uh, this is good for thin, thin material like I said but if you have a thick piece of material or a, a biface and you apply the force. I'm sure you've seen these illustrations before also. It produces a long fracture that has undulations and waves and unpredictability. Now, there's two words that I use to help uh, help me in my own mind explain what's happening and I just uh, I like using the terms waves and wedges 
to explain fracturing in flint and other nappable materials. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a close-up. There's more happening here than what meets the eye. So if you look at, let's say from the top view, this fracture here, like the BB hitting the glass, this is going to be part of the circle. There's little fractures or initiations of fractures all along the edge. Not only that way, but the other way. This is the thickness of the glass. And the main fracture, you know, radiates out this way. But if you look closely, there's little initiations in various areas. Not just here, but and then from the side view, see if I can do this. Uh, it's hard to illustrate. Let's see. Okay, so you got that pop out here, and let's say we cut this glass. You also have little fractures that initiate in here. Initiate out that way. Initiate in here. So there's a lot of little fractures all initiating in every in every direction. It's not just the ones that you see clearly in illustrations like this. So what determines where the material will break? Well, something has to make these little initiations actually expand. I call these wedges, these little initiations. Something has to wedge them open. And when that happens, that's when you get these long fractures. Uh, let's go back to this one here. If you've got a workpiece and you strike, you get a bubble of percussion and then the, for some reason there, there's some oscillation going on uh, after this initial bulb or after the initial conchoidal type fracture you get a straight portion right at the very beginning and then you get a bulb and then you've got it, a wave going back and forth and sometimes at the end this wave can get really crazy causing steps and hinges and so forth so this is what I call the wave here. So the wedges are these little initiations and the wave is what happens to the initiation after, after it starts going through the material. Now one of the important applications of this is, let's see, let's go back to this one here. If you have an, the side of your workpiece or an arrowhead that you're working on, hit it downward like this sometimes you'll have a crack that goes right across the whole piece snaps the tip off uh, what causes that well obviously there's a little initiation on the side of this ring that initially gets popped out <clears throat> and that gets propagated or wedged or expanded or helped along by certain forces. Now sometimes you have bending forces that will help that along. Like if there's too much pressure in the middle and you've got it bridged on either side and there's you know bending forces, that will help that fracture cut across the blade. Uh, another reason could be when you push a lot of force into the blade it can cause something called shear forces which act You know, they shear against each other like a movement of two plates in an earthquake. So, you know, there could be more pressure on this side acting this way, so you get kind of a sliding motion that can also propagate that crack. And you have also this type of situation where if it's not straight on and it comes down at the angle, your uh, applied force, this side of the fracture can actually move up and cut cut your piece in half. Let's say this is the tip here. 
if you're off at an angle, this this part of the uh, fracture can actually reverse itself and go across the blade. So there's three different ways I just described that that's, this could happen. Most of the time it's bending. You know, you've got a lot of force here and you're supporting the two sides and it, it bends and breaks in half. But there's also this here which can initiate a fracture that doesn't have anything to do with bending and also the shear force, the sliding of the two pieces against each other can also cause that to happen. So as you can see the conchoidal fracture doesn't really get come into the doesn't really help when I'm trying to explain why this happens and this happens all the time. Um, so I just wanted to go over that real quick the what I consider to be more of a, a uh, more of more of what happens with these fracturing with these fracturing events is uh, waves and wedges whereas the wave is what happens after the initial straight line of that fracture and these wedges are these small initiations that occur these small cracks that occur at the site of impact that forces acting on them wedge them open and they start to move through the material okay hope that made sense this is my third take on this video anyway hope that helps some people that's it